Welcome to Hear Her Sports. This is Episode 9 with Julie Emmerman, a clinical and sports psychologist who specializes in working with athletes from Olympians to amateurs like you and me. She offers some insights into her career, tips to improve performance, and ways to find a professional in your area if you'd like to start working with a sports psychologist yourself. Let's get started. Well, thanks for thanks for joining me. This is great. I'm really excited. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, anyway... So how did you get into sports psychology or psychology? And also, when I was thinking about it, it must be fun to work with sporty people and remain connected to that world after, since you've been a professional athlete yourself. Yeah. Um, so in my case, um, I had always been athletic. I was a varsity tennis player through high school, and I rode horses in college. And then in graduate school, I was completely, well, I would say almost completely sedentary. I maybe used the treadmill a couple times a week, if that. <laughs> um, and I moved out to Colorado uh, during my internship and got involved in mountain bike race or mountain biking at that time. And some friends suggested I try a race. And my response was literally, why would I race? I'm supposed to be growing up and getting a mortgage and things like that. <laughs> and they said, well, just do it for fun. So I jumped into a mountain bike race and I took to it like a fish to water. I loved it. And just couldn't wait to do more. And the next thing I knew, um, within a relatively short period of time, I was racing in the professional category and had sponsors and put my dissertation in the closet, um, called my parents and said, thanks for all your support. <laughs> but I'm going to race my bike for a while, <laughs> which um, growing up outside of Chicago was, was not something you would hear too often. So they survived. And um, I did, in fact, race professionally on the mountain bike circuit for, um, let's see, from like 1999 till 2003-ish. Um, and then that kind of ran its course. And I, I stopped or quote unquote retired. And um, by this point, I had finished up my degree and my dissertation and was developing a small private practice. And then within a year, I really missed being around ambitious, goal-oriented people. And so I re-specialized in sports psychology. And then um, from there, I was hired by the Garmin Slipstream men's team to work with their world tour pro tour athletes so i was traveling a bunch with them and, and learning a lot um and so that brought me back into just riding my bike a lot and i was racing or i i was riding my bike with the team and some people were questioning why did i stop racing and so on and so forth and again i was like well i'm <laughs> i think i'm going to focus on my career and um just ride recreationally from this point forward but then I had a health scare um, that woke me up pretty quickly, and I realized, you know, I really do still have this passion for racing, and I want to do it while I can, and you never know what's around the corner type thing. So I'll, I'm going to balance work with also racing because it's still a passion. So then I started racing on the road again, and here I am. I'm still racing um, in the women's professional peloton domestically. Oh, you are still racing. I didn't know that. Yep. So what do you like about racing versus just going out for, your, you know, your own daily ride? Um, for me, there is a beautiful energy that takes place when you're competing. There's not that much that's being exchanged verbally, but you can really get a sense for what's going on if you're paying attention. And I really do believe it brings out the best in all of us because you have to be so on it and, and so aware and so attentive and um, not just to what's going on around you, but within your own body, or it, just to make sure that you're staying hydrated and well-fueled. Um, that you're not expending too much energy. It really just encompasses total awareness. And I love that environment. So for me, I, I just, um, I feel quite at home there. Have you always liked that? Or does that come from your uh, psychology education? I think I've always enjoyed it. But when I was mountain bike racing, I didn't know how to get myself there. So I was more um, frantic and nervous all the time before races where, and that was actually part of the reason I wanted to get back into road racing. Cause I thought it would be kind of cool to apply so much of what I know now, um, that I didn't have the skills, you know, to use then. So the passion and the energy has always been there, but now I can direct it in a much more deliberate, effective way. Do you feel like you're more efficient? It sounds like you're more efficient now as a racer. Yeah, definitely more efficient with my energy and just by nature of doing it for a long time, I have things a little bit more organized. Um, but also with age, I notice sometimes things take a little bit longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> I understand that. I have to be more efficient in a lot of things. <laughs> right. And are you traveling also to race? I do. 
I'm, I'm able to pick and choose most of the races that I'd like to go to. Um, unfortunately, no enough people or um, have been invited on various teams um, so that I can compete at the different domestic races that require teams. Um, I do race for the Amy D Foundation quite often, which is a wonderful foundation that really strives to get young girls involved in racing, whether it's um, road racing, mountain bike racing, or cycle cross racing. And what is that organization? It's called the Amy D Foundation, which is named after Amy Dombrowski, who was a wonderful, wonderfully, ta- wonderful and wonderfully talented athlete um, who was unfortunately killed in a training accident in Belgium. Um, I think it was five years ago. So her um, brother and sister-in-law and some others have created a foundation in her name. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. And yeah. so, so how many races are you doing, I don't know, during the season, I suppose? I will probably race um, four of the larger domestic races. Um, so those are stage races. So each one is about a week long. And then various local races as well. How is the local scene where you're living? Well, I'm in Boulder, Colorado. So there is plenty of racing to be done, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. Um and then, you know, there's other races in the nearby area where, whether it's going to Arizona for a couple of races here or there, um, a few others around. So it's, it's pretty solid. And is there something that's coming up that you're particularly interested in, one of the bigger races that you're going to be traveling to? Uh, we do have the Tour of the Gila, which is in southern New Mexico, which is um, April, uh, I think it starts on April 18th, uh, no, sorry, April 19th. I love Tour of Gila. Have you been down to that area before? I lived in Albuquerque for five years. Oh, and also yeah, ra- yeah, and, ra- a- and race that. Okay, it's such a funky, unique, eclectic town. I think it's great. Yeah, they put on a very nice race. It's really professional. They do. They do. It's a really, really good race. Well organized. Um, it has all the elements required for just a really great challenge. My husband did it one time, one year, and he just remembers the watermelon at the finish line at the top of the Gila. <laughs> They really, they do a nice job. (laughs) So uh, it sounds like you do mostly cycling. You're not doing much of any other sports at this point. Right. No, I'm I'm, um, pretty uh, one trick pony at this point. Yes. Okay. What percentage of your clients are athletes? I would say right now, or generally speaking, 90% are athletes, but that ranges from weekend warriors to Olympians. Wow. I, I hadn't realized it was that such a large percentage. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a lot of fun because I get to work with a lot of triathletes, um, some golfers, some mixed martial artists, of course, obviously a lot of cyclists. Yeah. So I, I really enjoy it. And a wide variety of ages as well. Yep, definitely. i um, pretty much from 15 to 65. And why do they why do they come to see you? Is there are there specific events that happen, or is it uh, you know like some sort of traumatic event that happens, or are they preparing for a particular race or something like that? Uh, those are good questions. It's actually all of the above. So sometimes people will come to me because they're aware that they keep repeating a certain pattern in a race and they want help overcoming that kind of block. Um, For example, someone's having a hard time really pushing where they need to, say at mile uh, 24, you know, in a in a marathon or in an Ironman, for example. They're aware that in the Ironman Ironman competitions that they've done, there's certain points where they just know mentally they fall apart, and they're looking for skills and tools to use to help counteract that. Um, So it could be kind of a race preparation thing like that, or sometimes people come to see me because they are pretty impacted by either their own injury that happened during their sport or somebody else's injury that happened that they witnessed or um, just hits close to home for one reason or another. Um, Sometimes people are coming to see me because they're aware that they're going through a other life transition and they're looking for ways to compartmentalize so that they can still maintain focus in the sport that they're doing. Um, So it really, it really ranges. And and do you have stories of particular benefits or improvements that you've seen with with athletes <laughs> that you um, can share? 
tough one. I do. This is where um, it's hard. Psychologists are, it's hard to be self-promoting as a psychologist because you really can't say much at all. Um, I can't really give any details that would identify any one particular client. But I can say it is so rewarding to work with somebody and see how they're able to absorb things that we're talking about and practice some of the exercises that I might give them and then implement those things and to see somebody unlock their potential and execute and implement consistently and then get to another level of their sport. To me, it's, um, it's just a beautiful process to be a part of. And I feel really privileged to be a part of someone's life in that way. So in, in that answer, I became curious of, are, are you and the client working on something in your office or are you giving them suggestions that then they take out to the race or to their training or both? Um, well, all the sessions take place in my office. So, so no phone sessions. Well, I will do phone, um, or Skype if somebody's traveling. Um, or for example, if I'm on the road for a little bit that we can Skype or, or use a phone, but, um, the majority of sessions take place, take place, excuse me, in my office. And then, so in the example that you were sort of alluding to, I might help somebody with their pre-race strategy. So if somebody's aware that they just get so anxious that they really are just expending way too much energy before a race, um, and they need help dialing down their energy to something that's more functional, then we'll work together to develop a plan. Um, and whether that is, you know, it could be something so small, like making sure that you arrive in time to make sure you have time to just relax or, when you're warming up, don't face the spectators. Make sure you're facing somewhere that you can just close your eyes and do some deep breathing exercises. It could be as simple as that, or it could be more complex, like teaching somebody how to do progressive muscle relaxation and instructing them how to do that, having them practice it you know, a few times a week for multiple weeks before their event so that by the time they get to their event, it's, a, it's part of their routine and they know how to do that right there in the moment. A lot of that sounded... Uh, like time management or system management and a lot less of sort of what I picture psychologists mostly doing, which is sort of chatting about your mother. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one reason I like sports psychology because it is different in that way. Um, but I will say a lot of what we do wind up talking about does go back to our earliest influences, whether it's biological parents or not. Um, it could be a influential coach at one point or another but the narratives that we can carry in our heads are so important and even if it's something that you picked up when you were seven it could be the same narrative that you're telling yourself when you line up for any competitive event 20 years later so oh if, that's interesting i, had, I hadn't yeah. yeah that's interesting if and how that plays into one's perception of themselves and their anxiety or their attitude whether it's confident and um, a sense of competence or if they're feeling self-defeatist, those are all things that we do also wind up talking about very much so. Are there universal issues that you're dealing with? Are, or, or are there issues that come up mo very frequently with athletes? Um, yeah, I think there are um, definitely common themes. One of them, I th one of the biggest themes I think has to do with self-doubt. And wondering if people, you know, someone will come to see me because they're just never sure that they're good enough or what does it take to be good enough? How do they establish what that means um, for themselves, um, given that there's only one person who could win any given race? Um, you know, how do you how do you value your own performance? So self-doubt is definitely a, a theme. Fear of injury is another theme. Um Work-life balance tends to be a theme that I hear a lot about and work with a lot. Meaning uh, training racing w with your yeah. family? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, especially for triathletes, it's just very time-consuming. And so that can be a challenge when you're working and Many women are involved in other relationships or have families or both, and it's uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, so self-doubt, fear of injury, work balance, any other 
eating and food, disordered eating, there's a spectrum where on one hand there's disordered eating and then on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, there's eating disorders. And so that is also something I work with quite frequently. Are there differences in issues that you see from your male and female clients? And one reason I ask that is the work-life balance. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And interestingly, I find that because most women are already used to the reality that they need to work while they're training and racing, they are oftentimes uh, more equipped to handle transitions, whether it's a transition because their race schedule is now ramping up or a transition because they're injured or sick and have to dial down their training or a transition even from uh, just different periods like in their work life when things, you know, for an accountant, for example, if their work life is going to get more intense at certain months prior to tax season, it seems like women are pretty highly capable, at least the ones that I've been privileged to work with, at balancing those things and going with the flow of, okay, I'm juggling all these different balls and this one is going to require more of my energy right now. And this one has to be a little bit backburnered, but they have a lot going on all at once. And um, the men that I've worked with who often, the men I do see happen to be um, professional athletes who are paid substantially well and so they don't need to or also aren't able to have another job, they seem a little more vulnerable when transitions happen, such as injury or trans- and or transitioning out of their sport because they may not have either the education or skills to suppl- uh, supplement what they're going to do when they're done racing, competing. Yeah, I would, I would bet that that's a hard, a hard thing. Is Well, I, I relate to it personally, how you transition after racing. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, many people undermine, the, it's a huge transition. I mean, it, it can take at least a year for people to really start to get comfortable with a different routine of their life and just figuring out what do they want their life to look like? What can they do? What can't they do? How do you want it to, you know, if you're in a position where you're lucky enough to choose, what do you want it to look like? <laughs> you know, sometimes financially, we don't all have that choice and there's different decisions that need to be made. But I do find that women have a little bit more, um, I guess, of a buffer in that respect due to just either they've paralleled their educations and or work life pretty consistently while they're competing. Hmm. That's interesting. One thing that I wasn't prepared for was going from being really good at something and totally competent and experienced at something to starting all over again. Which, and I hadn't really understood the ramifications of that transition. Uh, I'm sure that would be, that sounds like it would be hard. It's uh, a very humbling experience. Very, very humbling. And it takes time. You know, on one hand, it could be refreshing because you get to start over. But I think also a lot of people tend to compare themselves with others. And then you start, it's common to for people to feel like they're behind the eight ball, they need to catch up, which is too bad because it sort of dismisses all the years that they've spent doing their sport. Right, right. And what they've gained from from doing right. that. Right. So we talked about the differences between men and women. What about the differences between the sports that you uh, your athletes are doing? Uh, you can group them maybe into endurance and non-endurance or in any way that you find interesting. Um, I would say one major difference is between sports that are um, more subjective versus objective. So uh, working with a gymnast... Um, who needs to impress a panel of judges is different than working with a sport that is timed, you know, a swimming event, a cycling event, and so on. So the subjective events are often very challenging and can really wear down an athlete, especially some of the younger, um, the younger women that I work with. So if you take, you know, for example, a 15 or 16 year old, um, even the most confident of them, uh, you know, who feel pretty empowered and and um, just overall have a lot of confidence, just subjecting themselves to a subjective sport over and over and over can eventually wear them down. If they don't also have, it can happen anyways, but I guess it's just a little bit trickier. Um, 
and they can seem more vulnerable or those sports can, can to me seem to p- make an athlete more vulnerable to things like self-doubt, uh, broken self-confidence, concerns about body image, because it, you know, simply because it is based on judging. Right, right. If somebody in sports wants to start seeing a sports psychologist, do you have recommendations of how to go about doing doing that? Yes, there is a pretty large network, actually, through the American Psychological Association. Um, it's the Division of Sports Performance Psychology. So there's many, many qualified professionals that um, someone can just do a search for to see if there is somebody in their area. Obviously, anyone listening to this is welcome to reach out to me and I can you know, see where they are and uh, reach out to colleagues via certain email lists that I'm on and see if there's anyone located in that area, wherever somebody um, is. Um, so there is actually a pretty broad network of professionals out there. And is somebody who is athletic, but, you know, not competing professionally, is a sports psychologist somebody that would be good for them to see just because they are sporty? Um. I think it depends on actually the practitioner. So that's a really good question because some sometimes um, sports psychology and sports psychology consultants focus more on cognitive behavioral approaches, which don't get into the family stuff that you were mentioning earlier. And yet then other sports psychologists will take a more holistic view into their work and will address more of the whole person with respect to their upbringing and so on and so forth. For me personally, it's hard to separate the two. Um, I always, I think to myself, you know, wherever you go, there you are. And in the sporting arena, when there's pressure, that's exactly the type of environment that that tends to bring up our stuff. And so um, I think that if you can address that, and if if a person's relatively functioning well in their day-to-day life, and then they go to a sporting event that they've been training for, and they notice that they self-sabotage, or they just somehow implode or they're just not getting the results that they feel they're capable of or they want to manage their anxiety better or they want to handle disappointment better, then that state, that's a great stage in which to learn on. So to me, a sports psychology, um, a sports psychology professional would be appropriate at that point in time. Right. One of the questions I had was sort of about uh, chronic issues versus uh, short term. And I don't really know how to phrase that question, but you know, you were talking about long-standing issues that sort of surface during the stress of competition. Um, And I guess I'm thinking versus, I don't know what I'm thinking versus, versus you get injured and you need to manage returning to competition. And how you, how you, how you as the sports psychologist deal with that. Um, Was that a, sorry, was that a clear question? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I got a little thrown off only because sometimes an injury can have longer lasting effects psychologically as the injury is longer than just after the bone has healed. Okay, well, let me ask you this this then in, in sort of a, a different way. Uh, it sounds like either from your experience, you now believe or you sort of your philosophy is that basically all the things that surface during sports are just us and sport is allowing it to surface. Is that mm-hmm. true? I tend to take that approach. I, I can't speak for others in my, you know, in the same profession. But to me, it's um, it's a it's a stage in which a lot of our humanity plays itself out. Yes, I think that's why I like it. Yeah, yeah, I I, I would agree. <laughs> All right. So, so getting back to if somebody wants to start seeing a sports psychologist. When you have a client, are you seeing that person every week, or if they're an athlete, they may be traveling? How do you work? work around that kind of schedule and any other tricks for for somebody wanting to get into this well in in my particular practice i have a pretty lengthy and excuse me lengthy intake form that i email people um and then i receive that prior to our first session and then during the first session after i've described important things that set the foundation up for the working relationship such as their rights as a client their rights to confidentiality and so on and so forth um, then we would have time to get into actually why they're there. And I do suggest that people um, see whoever they're seeing once a week, at least in the beginning, because the relationship needs to gain some traction. And then once you have some working momentum, 
depending on what's going on, um, then maybe it is appropriate for that person to come every other week, or maybe that person's traveling for an event, or, you know, I think you, each individual case needs to be assessed from there individually. But I, in the beginning, I think it's important to establish just that connection with the professional you're working with and um, establish rapport and, and get some goals lined up that you know you're both, you know, in line working with. Do you recommend that all sports people, uh, I guess professionals, athletes, see a sports psychologist or can benefit from that? Um, I, you know, I'm probably biased, but I think that it's always, it's another tool in the toolbox. Right. So I think that if you're devoting this much of your time, energy, and it's your passion, and it's something that, that, you know, for a professional, especially if you're banking your career on this financially, it's important to have a lot of various tools and I, I definitely don't think it could hurt. <laughs> so I think even if somebody's not utilizing a sports psychologist regularly, year after year, just knowing somebody and having that, you know, having that relationship established is important. Particularly in cases of in sports where there's a higher risk of injury or head injury, I think it's important to have certain working professionals on your team, quote unquote, your own personal team that know you and can notice and detect subtle changes over time. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, certainly. And are you currently working in, with any teams? Um, no, I'm not affiliated with any one team at the moment. Did you like doing that? Would you like to do that again? Uh, I loved it, and it was, a, it was a huge challenge and a big learning curve for me. But I absolutely loved it, and I'm grateful I had that opportunity for sure. You were working with, with cyclists, right? Right. The cy- cycling team. Would you be interested in any, any sports team? Um, I would think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, yeah. do you, do you feel you're more qualified with cyclists because you, you have done cycling or, or does that not really matter so much? Yeah. Somebody else asked me that recently and I had to think about it. So I'm, I'm actually glad you asked. I think that because I know my own life as a cyclist, um, and it's something that I constantly feel I am challenged to grow in, it definitely gives me a, a really broad range of my own experiences to just have as a backdrop. But that said, and I'm, I'm trying to really state this carefully, each person's experience is their own. So certainly I can relate to another endurance athlete when they're describing certain things. But more importantly is that I can understand where they're coming from and what it means to them. So I don't think that it is, a, is essential for the sports psychologist to um, have played that sport or to, to know that sport intricately. It's more important in how that sports psychologist is able to really connect and hear what that person's experience is like for them. And I think there's a universality of understanding body motion through space and through time and, Mm -hmm. you know, how it works. And then what happens when it doesn't work as well and the, the difficulty with that. Right, right, right. Is there an example that you can give of some kind of issue that you see frequently and maybe a solution that somebody listening could use? Oh boy, I'm on the spot. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't prepare for, for something like this. I have to really think. The problem is in the examples that I can think of, it's not like I can say, and I realize the appeal, um, or the desire for this on the audience side, but I can't really, if I could describe, oh, and here's what we did to correct this right. problem, then it really diminishes the, all the work that we do. <laughs> so I can't, and it's not that simple. I can't really say, well, here's what we did to fix this, and boom, you know, everything is peaches because. Well, that would go against your philosophy of <laughs> turn around and there you are. Right. Everywhere you go, there you are. Yeah. Everywhere you go, there you are. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I can think of some examples. I just can't think of how to describe to you. I can't short circuit the work that takes place to uh, that yields the end, you know, the outcome. Right. 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 Well, then let me ask you a, a different question. If somebody comes to you with some issues that they want to deal with or some problems that they're having competing, how long should they expect to spend working on these problems? Um, It's different for everybody. And 
some people can take to things like a sponge and they're off and running and other people um, it's a, a little bit more of a gradual process. Like an example I can give you is I have a couple athletes who for whatever reason just never feel like they quite belong. Their times and, or scores are right in there with you know their age group or their competitive level um, and they're improving but they just don't have a sense that they really deserve to be there. So we could address that from all sorts of angles. And then with each competitive event, that person has time, you know, it's an opportunity to practice those things. Um, and so that person might experience improvement um, in those areas. And also it usually parallels a, a performance boost um, because they're believing more in themselves and feel a part of things and are letting themselves in the experience versus just seeing themselves from the outside of it. Um, but then, you know, it's not, and then the person still competes and so they move on and they're, now they feel like they belong, but then maybe there's another thing like, okay, and now I want to deal with my sense of pressure because I'm at this different level and now I feel like there's more expectations on me. So I need help with uh, managing the pressure I feel to perform at this level all the time, things like that. I don't, I don't, I hope that's clear enough. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or another example would be, I've worked with a handful of clients who are uh, probably at the pinnacle of their sport, but they've had a major injury, whether it's concussion or some other, um, it could be a season ending injury that then they decide to call it, you know, time on their career or it's a career ending injury and it's really not even up to them, but then helping that person go through the transition of leaving their sport. So, you know, that, like we were saying earlier, that can take a long time. Right. And I'm going to try putting you on the spot again. But <laughs> you can just tell me no. But let's say you're a cyclist just by chance, and you really hate climbing. And so every time you get to a hill, mm -hmm. uh, you start, you know, like the anxiety picks up in a variety of ways. Uh, have you ever had that experience? Is that somebody ever come to you with that? And what are some self talk? I'm I'm trying to find a sort of a self talk. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Switch. That's a, that's a pretty simplified case. So um, in that in those scenarios, it is a lot about adjusting somebody's self talk, um, helping them use the feedback that they're getting from their various training workouts to see, to to use objective data to help them see that actually they're probably not climbing nearly as. Um, Bad, badly as they feel. So how to separate the data and the objective information from what they're feeling is oftentimes very important. I would talk to them about what makes them feel like they're, you know, wh why, what is going on that they, when they say they hate climbing, what is it, a, is it that they hate the physical sensations? Do they, are they uncomfortable with these sensations going on in their breathing and their legs? And how can we maybe re-identify or reframe how they view those physical sensations and then we would also utilize some imagery to be able to pick out certain things on any climb and be able to use self-talk to help them get to that designated spot and then give themselves a chance to say okay I've, i made it here let's see how much further i can go or i made it to this tree now let's i'm just going to get to that tree you know so you're breaking up a long climb into sections which often helps cool <laughs> so there's a lot you can do and a lot of it is um i think sports psychology is a nice mix of things that are i i would say just more uh like concrete templates that you could apply and then refine for each individual and then there's also room to go much deeper into somebody's experience so we're now at 41 minutes so i was wondering if w there was anything that you wanted to add or or you had some topics you'd like to discuss um, I guess I would just encourage people to be open to the process and the teachings that sport allow for. And I, I find that so many people are just really fixated on the outcome. And of course, we all race because we want to win. And yes, that's the goal. But there is so much to be learned in the process of training and the ups and downs and everything about it that I oftentimes meet with people who kind of have an expectation that everything should go seamlessly. And if it doesn't, they're never going to reach their goals. But the, but what's true is that it doesn't go perfectly seamlessly for anybody, like hardly ever. <laughs> and so it's not just about reaching your goal. It's about how you get there and, and 
how do you manage your emotions throughout the process of getting there? You know, who do you have around you that's supportive or not? And can you identify the ways that they're supportive so that if that person were to go away, can you supply that for yourself? Or do you have ways of asking for those things from others? Um, just really getting specific with what you need and want to help your self have your strongest performance. Um, so I think it's just really important to pay attention to the process and balance that. Like paying attention to the process will help you get to the best outcome you can have. So I think that's important. I also think it's important to always be aware of how you are an ambassador for your sport. I think in particularly with cycling and the conflict between conflicts between cyclists out on the road all the time, it's really important to be a good ambassador for the sport. But even beyond that, just how you can impact others, maybe who have a sedentary lifestyle or kids and, you know, just helping others get exposure to the benefits of being physically active, whether it's competitive or not. That's great. Wow. That, that's awesome. Great. <laughs> One of the questions that I really enjoyed talking to people about is whether they compete or they uh, simply train and what they get out of each of those things, um, which I started to think about when you were talking about it, about mm -hmm. sport being the process. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I think some people do just enjoy the training and like to see the different changes that go on in their bodies throughout the training process and whatever sports they're training for. And some people really do need to have a goal, um, you know, some kind of event that they respect enough to keep them on track. Right. One of the things that I miss, I, I actually really, really like training, but one of the things I miss competing is the tactics and, you know, like having to get yourself from the start to the finish, whatever that start and finish is. Mm -hmm. And and sort of the, the structure of that. Um, yeah, I think that, that speaks to the beauty that I was trying to um, describe earlier when you asked me what I like about racing. Um, but I think it's, it's just such a unique uh, period of time where you get to say nothing else matters. <laughs> nothing else matters. I am doing my best to get from here to there. Right. right. You know, barring few things, nothing else matters. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, great. I, I so appreciate you talking to me that it's wonderful. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. I, I, I really, I love what you're doing and I, I hope, um, I just wish you all the success. It's great. Well, thank you. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, Elizabeth. This has been really fun. Yep. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Other episodes are available on iTunes, Stitcher, and from the hearhersports.com listen page. Please tell your friends about Hear Her Sports podcast so we can reach as many sports lovers and athletes as possible. Join us on Facebook. I'd love to hear your rugby questions for an upcoming guest. For the next couple of months, I've partnered with Joy Machines Bike Shop right here in Cleveland, Ohio. For Hear Her Sports listeners, they've offered a 10% discount on purchases up to $100. But stay tuned for our next offer. I'm really excited to tell you about a new partnership very soon. Find details on the membership page of hearhersports.com. Thank you to Joy Machines, Gold Mines, Leap, and Agnes Studio for your support. And thank you for listening. Have a great week. Hey there, and welcome to the Joy of Paddle podcast, hosted by me, Minter Dial, a veteran of the paddle tennis world, and sponsored by Paddle 1969. Whether you're a paddle tennis aficionado, just beginning, or have never even heard of paddle, or padel, as it's called in North America, this is an exhilarating new show that delves into the captivating stories of notable paddle personalities worldwide. In its inaugural season, you'll be treated to exclusive anecdotes, valuable tips, life lessons, and humorous moments shared by esteemed professional paddle players, industry insiders, and passionate paddle enthusiasts. With each season aligning with a pro tour, you can anticipate two engaging episodes per month.
The Joy of Paddle Podcast is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network, where you can find other great shows in a number of categories, such as sports, health and wellness, true crime, and fiction. To find out more about Evergreen Podcasts, go to www.evergreenpodcast.com. Vamos! Vamos!